Hello, and thank you for attending my session here at the um, DevOps Summit Canada. I want to uh, thank the organizers of Dev DevOps Summit Canada for inviting me. I so much appreciate the shout out um, and I'm giving it right back. So today we're going to talk a little bit about SBOMs and how to evolve your pipeline, your existing DevOps pipeline, to support a more DevSecOps process. Uh, this has been in the news. There's a lot of information around supply chain and supply chain security and open source security. And I'm going to talk a little bit about all of that and how it actually impacts our DevOps pipeline. So I think the question we all have to ask ourselves is, how easy is it to do a software recall? Um, now, I know that you all know that if something in your jar of peanut butter went bad, uh, if, especially if you used a credit card at the grocery store where you bought it, they could pretty much notify you that this was a problem. At minimum, they can say geographical area, this is where this, this uh, particular ingredient went to. And if you live in this geographical area, you need to um, throw away or return, get, get, a, get a new bottle of uh, a jar of peanut butter. Um, they can even do it with lettuce growing in a field that bad water has got, uh, gotten on the lettuce and now is causing E. coli. They can tell us exactly what region it went to, what farm it came from, who, who created the problem, and <clears throat> make sure that nobody eats that lettuce. This, these are, food is complex, and tracking that particular supply chain is complex, and they can do a recall. But as a software industry, we've never been able to do a recall so, uh, quite so well, and it's because we don't always know what we're, we're adding to our software. So... We as an IT community cannot ensure that the software we deliver is safe for consumption. We don't know because there's so many downstream dependencies and developers simply cannot easily know and control the ingredients they use because it is becoming too complex. So I call this a massive global problem. We have to solve this problem, not in a geographical area, but we have to solve it from a, from a, from a global perspective. And we really are at a breaking point when, we, when we're talking about these more complex software systems. Um, the, because of the complexity, it is almost impossible to solve this with our current DevOps pipeline and the tools that we currently use. We need to evolve that DevOps pipeline and we need to start changing it so that it can handle the understanding of where, what is being used in our software that we, that we write where those components come from, their, its provenance, uh, and, and understand the full map of our dependencies that we are actually consuming and delivering out to our end users. So just a, an introduction of myself. So who is this person talking about SBOMs? Um, my name is Tracy Reagan. I am the CEO of Deploy Hub. I am somewhat of a microservice evangelist. You may have heard me speaking about microservices and SBOMs and microservices have a lot to do with each other. I'm super passionate about supply chain management, what used to be called lifecycle management and the governance around the supply chain. I'm also the community director of a project called Ortilius that's incubating under the Continuous Delivery Foundation. I'm a board member of the Open SSF, which is an organization um, specific to tracking uh, and, and securing open source software. I'm a board member uh, of the CD Foundation's uh, Technology Oversight Committee. I was a founding board member of the CD Foundation and the Eclipse Foundation. I work with the DevOps Institute. Um, I also now host the uh, uh, Tech Strong Women for DevOps.com, and I've been seen as a tech beacon. I've been doing this for quite some time, so my name's gotten around. And if you'd love to chat on this topic or any other topic, you can reach me at tracy-reagan-oms on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm always happy to ping me and I'll send you my calendar invite. Okay, so let's talk about Log4j. Now, I know we all know the story. Um, if you haven't, then you're, you're in for a ride. Um, back in December of 2021, about a year ago, uh, a pretty severe vulnerability was found in a piece of shared code, open source code called Log4j. Uh, Log4j 
basically is uh, consumed by, used by many Java developers and it has to do with logging. Um, well, the vulnerability that was found back in December had uh, allowed hackers or anybody um, to really take control over the operating system of where Log4j was running. So there was an exit basically that allowed you to jump out. Uh, and between December 9th and, and December 21st, Semantics intrusion uh, detection system blocked more than 93 million um, log4j related exploitation attempts on more than 270,000 unique machines. So once it was found, obviously 270,000 unique machines that that exploit that vulnerability kept being exploited over and over and over. So this was a severe problem, um, and it impacted about 44% of enterprises. It's a big, big, big problem. And again, that's why I call it a massive global problem. This is something that companies worldwide uh, had to deal with. And, it, and everybody was using some of those same, uh, the same Log4j. And it was a particular version of Log4j or several versions of Log4j. So you had to know where, you, where it was running in order to fix it. And this, was, this is what became a big problem for everybody. Something as common as Log4j having a, a vulnerability, how do you fix it? How do you do a software recall? So we suddenly discovered the importance of SBOMs. Um, while some of us, like myself, we've been talking about auditing the build and understanding your dependencies for years and years and years, it seemed like something that maybe was just too much work to deal with. And you know, maybe, the, maybe back then, uh, exploiting your software because you had log4j in it, um, maybe that there, there was less risk. But now because of the overwhelming use of open source software, most organizations today use open source software, we have to start thinking about our ingredients. We have to start thinking about SBOMs. And as Jim Zimlin, the executive director of the Linux Foundation points out, he says SBOMs will play an essential role and building more trust and transparency in how software is created, distributed, and consumed throughout the supply chain. And yeah, this is this went all the way up to the to the White House, the desk of the White House. Um, so it is time to get serious about S bombs. Uh, back in May, after this December problem, President Biden signed an executive order that established improvements to software supply chain. And among those improvements are, hey, if you're going to deliver software to the U.S. government, you've got to deliver an SBOM with it. You have to provide a software bill of material that shows the ingredients uh, that you're delivering to the U.S. government. Now, in the past, SBOMs were, were important for licensing um, issues. So if you're consuming an open source piece of code, you need to know if, if it's an appropriate license that you can distribute it. But now we've decided that SBOMs need to be seen at a different level. And that level is the dependencies. What are we consuming? What is included? What is, what's that list of ingredients that we're going to put on the jar of our, our software instead of our peanut butter? I highly recommend you reading this document. Um, you can find it in the whitehouse.gov briefing dash room presidential actions of May 12th, 2021. You'll see that executive order, and it's a very good read. There's a lot of good information about why that executive order was pushed across, uh, what, rec what the recommendations are, and what the government will be looking for in SBOMs. They've since done more work around the Log4j exploit, um, and there's a lot of good information about um, how Log4j uh, occurred and what occurred after that, and how the government sees the problem and sort of the, um, a plan to improve. So what does an SBOM show? So like I said, licensing used to be the reason why most companies wanted an SBOM. Um, if you're a company like Deploy Hub and you're delivering software to uh, your end users, they often wanna know if you're using any open source software that, that has licensing um, that might create some restrictions. So that's what SBOMs, uh, from a legal perspective, were always uh, uh, used for. And oftentimes it was small companies or uh, software providers who managed uh, and worried about SBOMs. But that doesn't mean an enterprise uh, worried about SBOMs. 
But now enterprises need to start worrying about SBOMs. And what they need is a list of the software dependencies that they consume, both what, what I call open source, the obvious stuff, and inner source. So you might be you might have a common code team and what are the, who's using those components of the common code team because the common code team obviously is something that you're consuming and they also have open source consumption as well. They, you, they show a list of license obligations. And from this information, you can derive your vulnerabilities. So you can take a list of your dependencies and you can go and look against a CVE database and say, these are my vulnerabilities. So an SBOM is the sort of the, the point of the spear when it comes to hardening cybersecurity for this particular area, because it is going to give us the list of ingredients that we need to derive all of this information. Now, the bigger problem we have is that every single time you do a software update, you need a new SBOM. And anymore, changes happen all the time. This whole point of creating a DevOps pipeline is to be able to push a new free, uh, updates as frequently as possible, where every time a new update is, is made, a new SBOM is, is, needs to be generated. Anything that's impacted by a, a common piece of code impacts everything that consumes it. So the point is, it is truly like herding cats. Um, and if you've ever tried herding cats, you'll know it's really hard. And our cloud native uh, direction just makes it harder. Uh, microservices, as I said, I'm a fan of microservices. I truly believe in, in architectures that are built on top of reuse. I believe it is how we create agile businesses. I'm not talking about agile development, but businesses being able to be agile and to be able to respond to something like a log4j issue. Truly, every single container in the world shouldn't have a log4j built into it. Maybe log4j should have been its own container. We would have fixed it in one place. And that's the reason why I like microservices. But if you take a look at this image, think about the, the image on the left here. This is the entire Uber cloud native environment. Lots of points. But what you're getting, to, what's being delivered to you is a set of points. And in cloud native, every single container has an SBOM. But what we need to be able to deliver at the is SBOM at the application level. And application linking is done at runtime. So we don't do a monolithic build and generate a monolithic SBOM. So now we have to start being able to figure out an SBOM based on what, what I like to call a logical application. So it, we're just making it harder. So tracking the security is becoming harder while potentially developing software is becoming easier. So this is why it's time to shift, right? We have to start shifting about how do we make the security as easy as creating the software? Which means it's time to add us bomb star DevOps pipeline in order to be able to keep up with the changes that are being pushed across to our end users and to be able to report and feel comfortable about being able to um, say, yes, the software is safe because I know what's in it. It's gonna have to be pushed out to the pipeline. It's gonna have to be automated. And the reason why it has to be automated is because it is simply too difficult for humans to reason. As Tyler Jewell um, talks about in his de developer-led landscape, this off these are awesome articles. If you've never read his articles, I highly recommend them. Um, he says that software systems have become so complex that it's give getting too difficult for humans to reason about the systems they design. The complexity spans the team, even small projects with 20 dependency have a broader committer graph of 10,000 engineers. The tooling, the architecture, and the users are all impacted. So se securing the software supply chain has leaped to the top of the CIO, CDOs, and for 2022. And I think we've heard that over the course of the last year. Lots of talk about software supply chain, lots of talk about open source security, and a lot of talk about SBOMs and how to get a handle on these dependencies. So where does NSBOM fit into the pipeline? I think it's probably the best question to be asking. There's really three types of SBOMs. There's source, meaning source to artifact SBOM. Um, and this is something that you would uh, have to generate in the build as well as the artifact to artifact SBOM. So what binaries are you using, what libraries? Then there's an SBOM at the OS level um, and the OS level of dependencies that impact the runtime. 
So source, build, and deploy kind of sounds like our pipeline, right? We need to be begin to add SBOM generation and the tracking of dependencies into our pipeline. And these are the three types of SBOMs that we'll need, be, need to be looking at. Right now, most organizations are really focused on either source or build. We haven't gotten to deploy yet, but we will because it is just as important. Just like in the build, it's just as important to understand the version of the compilers you're using because the compilers have stuff that they add. So every single piece of the whole puzzle, we really have to look at in a detailed way and start managing. There are two standards, um, SBOM standards, that I would recommend you take a look at. One is um, SPDX. This is something that's being um, uh, managed by the Linux Foundation. And Cyclone DX, uh, some of you uh, may have already heard of uh, Cyclone DX. I took these two definitions from a, web, a blog uh, out by a company called Settletop. It was a, it's a great blog. I add it there so you can take a look at it because I think they do a really good job of defining SBOM standards. Um, but both of them are pretty much being um, accepted across the industry. Most tooling supports both SPDX and Cyclone DX. The point of me showing these to you is so that you go learn about both of them. As you move into managing SBOMs and uh, taking ownership over it, you should understand the differences. There's a lot of tooling around uh, Cyclone DX. Um, there's a lot of uh, work that's been done around SPDX. So uh, I don't think it matters one or the other. Pick one and move forward. There are some challenges, however, to adding SBOMs to the pipeline. Um, probably the biggest challenge is every build needs to be updated. Uh, if you're not already generating SBOMs, that means you need to. You're going to have to start editing uh, all your, your build scripts to include the, um, the SBOM scanning as part of it. Now, my kind of complaint is even if you do um, generate an SBOM, it simply sits underneath the build directory. It doesn't really um, get consumed or referenced unless it's needed. It's sort of something that you push out there just in case you might need it. But boy, is it hard to go look through all those build directories if you're trying to figure out what version of Log4j somebody might be using. So you do the work to add the SBOMs to the pipeline, but we don't necessarily have good solutions for tracking them. This is, you know, the, the industry has said we, we're figuring out how to, how to standardize on SBOMs, what SBOMs should include, how to, to scan them. But now let's do something with the data. And there is no easy way to centralize the SBOM data to make it relevant. This is something I'm very passionate about. It's something I'll talk to you about with, about the Ortelius project. But I don't blame people for not embracing SBOMs because of the simple fact that it just sits in a, in a, a build directory and it, we are not doing anything with it. And there is an amazing amount of DevOps intelligence sitting inside that SBOM. Um, and every single time a new build is, is, is ran, you have to, there's a new SBOM under there that shows differences. And, and there's information that we could be using to even to predict the success um, of a deployment, but we don't. Uh, and it's a habit we've never gotten into. And I'm hoping that we can change that. So just a couple of things that you to move forward. Um, I pr provided quite a bit of information there. Uh, but there's particularly there's two there's two things I, I would suggest. Learn a little bit about the Open SSF. I am on the board. Full disclosure, I have chosen this group because I feel like they're doing a really great job of getting a handle on open source security. Um, they have several streams they're working on uh, in a sort of an implementation plan for the industry. They've also uh, announced an end user working group. Anyone can get involved. You do not have to be a member of the OpenSSF. If you'd like to get involved in their end user working group, you can, which means that you can start talking to other people who are struggling with SBOMs, what they're looking for, how they want to use them, how they should be consumed. Um, and you, it's just a really good place to start uh, and start learning as well. The other one is Ortelius. As I said, I'm the community manager for Ortelius, and it's an open source catalog for tracking your supply chain. And it also tracks SBOMs and CVEs for every change you push across. And it's particularly suited for microservices. So if you're building out a, um, a microservice architecture, this 
whole SBOM uh, problem becomes a little more challenging and requires more than an Excel spreadsheet. And Ortelius is there to uh, solve that problem using a catalog. So if you think about what we're doing with Ortelius is we're creating a central evidence store, um, one that would take information from SPDX or Cyclone, takes uh, information from your CVE databases, from SigStore, from NIST, information from Quay or Git, JFrog and Helm. And we pull that information in, we get the provenance, we get the dependencies, we understand the licensing, the vulnerabilities and the configurations. And then what we do with that information is store it and we track it based on a logical application version. So we internally track now who's consuming these particular components based on a logical application. Um, and that gives us the ingredients for a logical application in a microservices world. Even if you have 300 microservices that all have their own SBOMs, we're gonna aggregate that information up to the logical application level so you can produce a logical SBOM. Um, it's gonna show your, your exposures and your impact. Um, you can start building zero trust policies around that data. It shows you your inventory and the most important, your history. So in the Log4j example, uh, Ortelius could have shown you who is consuming Log4j and what versions of that uh, of Log4j was being consumed by what versions of your software. So anytime we think about this, we have to remember that we version code all the time. And that means that we have new versions of builds, which means we have new versions of applications, which means we have new, v new CVEs and new SBOMs for every single, every single version that we push out there. And that is the part that gets really big and really um, consumes a lot of headspace and you can't do it anymore in an Excel spreadsheet. So if you're pushing um, Ortelius through your pipeline, the goal is to, to hoard as much information, to suck up much, as much information into that central catalog as possible. It gets triggered at your pipeline at the point in time as you do your container push. Um, it gets triggered to say, oh, there's a new container out there that has probably got a new SBOM. I need to go get that information and I need to pull it in. It can also be triggered when you deploy that container. So we can, Ortelius can report to you where that particular version is running. And so what it begins to do over time is it's tracking your changes um, across your, your DevOps, DevOps pipeline. So every time something new has been um, updated to a container or a build is executed, now you have a new build, we get triggered at those points to bring the information in so that those SBOMs are not just sitting out on some build directory and we're actually generating CVEs for them and putting it in a dashboard that everybody can see and respond to. Um, the information then you can start building policies around and zero trust policies in particular. So you can start evolving the pipeline because you have the data in a central place. So I would say get started. Um, as I said before, the OpenSSF is a good uh, organization to start learning about, become an end user, start joining their end user work working group, get involved, share your opinion, learn. Um, learn about Ortilius. Uh, you can uh, find it on GitHub at Ortilius. Uh, there's the LinkedIn address, uh, or you can find us on Twitter at Ortilius OS. And as I said before, you can find me at Tracy-Reagan-OMS on LinkedIn or at Tracy Reagan on Twitter. And again, if you want to chat, I'm happy to. If you shoot me a, a ping me on LinkedIn, I'll send you that uh, Let's Chat um, uh, calendar uh, invite so that you can put some time on my calendar and we can have an even deeper conversation uh, around why SBOMs in your DevOps pipeline is important. Hey, thank you. Thank you all. And I want to give a particular shout out to Garima Bajpai, who uh, invited me to do this and who has been an amazing contributor to Ortilius as well as the Continuous Delivery Foundation. Uh, she's been an amazing ambassador uh, chair, and uh, I thank her for all of her work. Thank you again. I hope you enjoy the rest of DevOps Summit Canada. <laughs>